My name is Philip, but my friends call me Phil or Master P as I was known back then. Yeah, I know it's the name of a famous rapper, but I had another friend who went by Mr. T. It was kind of our stick. But this story isn't about corny nicknames. It's about a strange girl that I picked up 20 years ago and why I can't ever forget about her. I was 28 years old and had been driving taxis for 7 years. It was supposed to be a part-time gig until I graduated college. Well, graduation came and went, and I couldn't find another job, so I decided to stick with it. Over the course of those seven years, I met my fair share of weirdos, drunks, prostitutes, fellow late-night workers, and an assortment of other creatures who call themselves human. This particular night, I'd picked up a group of four young adults. It was the girl in question, along with three guys. They looked pretty normal, not drunk or high, which was a rarity for their age group. The guys were very talkative, and I got to know a couple things about them. The ringleader was Fred, a tall Asian rocker. Next was Jim, a rotund black goofball, and then Carl, a white bread nerd. Fred explained that his car had broken down earlier that day, forcing him and his companions to walk. Jim grew tired of that and decided they should hail a cab. Carl was hesitant because he thought I or some other psycho taxi driver might try to kill them. I joked that I only kill during the daylight hours and preferably young hot women. Fred and Jim laughed, but Carl wasn't amused. We continued to shoot the shit as I drove them to their destination. I noticed the girl hadn't spoke this whole time, so I tried shifting the conversation towards her. Playing off the killer remark, I made some lame comment about how she was the only one smart enough not to spill her secrets to me, so I'd spare her life. She didn't respond, but Fred said she was shy. I inquired more about her, and he told me her name was June, and that she and Carl attended the local university. He and Jim had dropped out last year, after they realized they didn't want to be a doctor and an accountant, respectively. The talking died down, until I saw June whisper to Fred through the rearview mirror. Fred nodded his head, and then told me there was a change of plans. Instead of me taking them all to his house, they wanted to be dropped off at their own places. He apologized for making me go out of the way, and said he'd pay full fare for everyone. Carl said his house was just back the other way, so I busted a small U-turn and dropped him off first. He got out in front of a two-story house in a nice suburban neighborhood. I figured it belonged to his parents and decided to honk the horn to let them know their son was home. Carl shot me a dirty look and ran into the house as soon as he saw the living room light turn on. Jim laughed, but he was next. However, his neighborhood looked a bit rough, so I decided to cruise through and not draw attention. After that, it was down to June and Fred, and I thought the gentlemanly thing to do would be to drop her off first, but Fred insisted his stop was closer and that June enjoyed long car rides. He handed me $200 as he got out. The meter read 63, but he said it was to cover June's ride as well as a tip. Seeing how he lived in a newly built high-rise, I assumed he could spare it, and I didn't argue. I asked June where she lived, and she didn't answer. Remembering that she was shy, I turned on the radio, hoping it would make her more comfortable. Some crappy, albeit popular, song came on, and I asked her if she liked it. Again, no answer. I gave it a few minutes, thinking maybe she'd open up on her own. Eventually, she said something, but I couldn't quite make it out. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I said. She said it again, but I still didn't catch it. I turned off the radio. Could you repeat that one more time? Do you see yourself on the TV? She asked. It was an odd question, made even stranger by her childlike voice. Assuming she meant, do I imagine myself as famous, I replied that I was in a band in high school and dreamed of making it big, but I don't care about stuff like that anymore. She shook her head and said again, Do you see yourself on the TV? This time, I said my best buddy had been an extra in a movie. It was the closest thing to seeing myself on it. She frowned and started looking out the window. I examined her through the mirror. She was pretty although I couldn't tell what her ethnicity was. Being the logical man that I am, I declared her to be all three of the races the guys were. 
She had long black hair styled in bunches and wore an old-fashioned floral dress. She caught my stare. It's getting late, she said. The clock read 11.15, and I was inclined to agree. Where's your stop? I asked. Will you turn on the TV? She said. I didn't understand her obsession with TV, but I promised her I would. Then you can stop right here. I pulled up in front of an old industrial building. I had a strong feeling she did not live there, but I was tired and had spent enough time with this girl already. I wished her good night, and she gave me a wave before disappearing into the shadow of the building. When I got home, I threw myself on the couch and turned on the TV. I know it was stupid, but I just had to see what she was talking about. I must have flipped through every channel hoping to find a doppelganger to no avail. I eventually settled on a late night movie channel and half-heartedly watched it until I fell asleep. As soon as I did, I heard a familiar voice say, Hello. I perked up and looked straight at the TV. Staring back at me was June. Hello, Philip, she said in a sweet voice. I'm glad you turned on the TV. I sat there in shock. Was I dreaming or was she really on the TV? Would you like to see yourself? She asked. I was scared, but I said yes. The next thing I know, I'm seeing myself lying in bed. My alarm rings and I knock it off my nightstand. Funny, I thought. I did the same thing that morning. I roll out of bed and head for breakfast. I get dressed and the outfit I have on is the same one I'm wearing. I eat the same breakfast, toast, eggs, and bacon. I made a phone call to my mom that morning, then I picked up my first passenger of the day. You might have guessed, it was the same guy from this morning. I watched my whole day play out, all the way up until I picked up June and her friends. You can watch any episode, she said before vanishing. Unable to comprehend what just happened, I shut my eyes tight and tried to sleep. The following day, everything went as usual. I didn't see June or the guys again. Part of me was relieved, while the other half was disappointed. I wanted to tell her I saw myself on TV. Her reaction would tell me if I dreamt it, or if it was some kind of elaborate high-tech joke. That night, I laid in my bed and watched some good old cartoons. Suddenly, the broadcast was cut off, and I saw June appear on screen. This time, I knew I wasn't dreaming. I'd called off early and took a nap, waking up about an hour ago. Hello, Philip. She said in the same voice, Did you enjoy last night's episode? I didn't know what to say. Knowing my life was a TV show for her unnerved me, but also made me angry. My privacy was being invaded by a girl whom I didn't know existed until yesterday, and there was seemingly nothing I could do about it. I don't want to watch myself, I said. You don't have to watch today's episode, she replied. Just hearing her say that made me sick. Remember, you can watch any episode, she said. Any episode? I reiterated. She nodded. Show me the day I was born. I know it was ballsy, but I still had a hard time believing it was real. Perhaps someone snuck into my house and placed a hidden camera and attached one to me somehow. If she couldn't show me my own birth, then I'd be right. If she could, I was screwed. I was major screwed. Not only did she show me my birth, but the full nine months leading up to it, I learned that I was actually my parents' fourth child. The other ones were either miscarried or stillborn. But I was born from another man's sperm without my dad's consent. He begged my mom to abort, but she wouldn't. That's when his drinking problem began and what would later cause them to divorce. The episode went off and I was left feeling hollow. These were family secrets, never meant to come out. The siblings that could have been the humiliation of my father. The first sign of their marriage breaking down. I cried for hours. 
My nights were spent watching episodes of my life. I saw myself take my first steps, go to my first day of school, and many other milestones. I watched all the mistakes I made and all the embarrassing moments I had. Sometimes I laughed, sometimes I cried. It stopped scaring me and became comforting. One evening, I got a call to pick up a couple of people from a local pizza joint. I was surprised to see that it was June, Fred, Jim, and Carl. I'd become accustomed to seeing June on the TV, to the point that it felt unreal to see her in person. I greeted them, and Jim asked how I'd been. I told him I was on a self-discovery journey. I saw a quick smirk appear on June's face. I dropped Carl off at his parents' house again, and Jim at work, June accompanied Fred to his apartment. He lingered behind while she got out. Something wrong? I asked. He shifted from side to side. Do you watch TV? He asked. Doesn't everybody? I said with a chuckle. Do you see yourself on the TV? I swallowed hard. I couldn't bring myself to answer the question. You can see other people too. He said, looking me in the eye. I nodded, and he got out of the car. I skipped watching TV that night, but his words stuck with me. So, the next night I tried it out. I asked June if I could see the day my parents got married. She obliged. From there, I asked about other family members, friends, former flames, and even random people on the street. It was exciting, but I also felt disgusted with myself for prying into these people's lives. June assured me they would never know but I couldn't help but feel guilty. Where do you see yourself in the future? June asked me one night. Never really thought about it. I replied, I don't want to drive taxis forever. Do you want me to show you the future? It never occurred to me until then that I could take a look at the future. She did say any episode, but I assumed it was only the episodes we have already lived. I do. I said, but can I see your future too? My future, she said, puzzled. Yes, I want to see your future and my future, I said. Perhaps we'll still know each other. Without saying anything, she showed me my future. I'll quit my taxi job and go into business with my friend. The business will bloom and I'll meet a wonderful woman named Sandra. We'll get married, and have two kids, and live an idyllic life in the suburbs. My father will die, but not before making amends with me and mom. Mom will get cancer, but pull through and become an excellent grandmother to my kids. It made me emotional knowing there was such an amazing life awaiting me. As for June, her future was less clear. Literally, there was nothing but static. I was about to turn off the TV when a black and white soap opera came on. June stared as the mistreated middle daughter of a wealthy family who was having an affair with a doctor. Fred, her parents' personal accountant was Jim, and her dogged nice guy best friend was Carl. Some new neighbors had moved in, and her mother dragged her over to meet them. Those new neighbors, my future family. It's been 20 years since then, and everything she showed me has happened. My wife is cooking downstairs, and my children are playing outside. As I type this up, my TV flicks off and on twice. It's one of those cheap off-brand smart TVs, so I figure it's on the fritz. But then I look out my window and see my children talking to a young woman wearing an old-fashioned floral dress.